Our next guest on Profunda TV is known for taking the nonsense out of making career choices. Dr. Susan Meyer calls herself a serial careerist, and in her new book, she offers a refreshing approach for building a path towards success at any age. Dr. Meyer is a seasoned certified life and executive coach whose clients sing her praises. You are watching CNJN Television with host Phyllis Haynes. This new book of yours is a life changer. Why now? Why this book? You know, there's more than one reason, and I do have to say it's such a delight to be interviewed by you again, uh, but more and more women in particular are staying in the workforce longer. Um, more and more people have had their lives disrupted by changes in the economy, by divorce perhaps, by jobs becoming obsolete, and younger people in general have what I call a serial career to begin with because they don't tend to stay in the same job. And I know from many years of coaching and there many years of making some interesting career mistakes that there's a process and a plan and I, I had to share it. Well, let's say more about, because you know, your title is I'm Susan, I'm a serial careerist. First of all, where did this term come from? How did you come to this idea? I didn't know how else to describe my own career because even though I stayed in related fields and actually spent a number of years within the civil service structure in the city of New York, still each job was very different. Each job called for different skills. And I said, okay, that's what this is. This is a serial career, just like sort of like a soap opera would be or a serial drama, uh, not to be confused <laughs> with serial killers who have nothing to do with this at all. Okay, so you see a pattern. You've, you've actually identified a whole host of changes in the way people are functioning in their careers. And you've identified a, actually a number of patterns that are possible for people. And in a way, I think you have created a kind of healing for people who have negative thoughts about what their careers look like. So let's start from the beginning in a sense of where you're going. You write about the fact that the whole concept of career has changed. So let me start there with you. How has the whole notion of career been altered? Well, many people in my age cohort took a job when they graduated from high school or college and stayed there in that one place until they retired. The women were likely to take time off to have children, but they would come back. Um, I don't know if your mother told you this, but my grandmother told me you should be a teacher because that way you'll have summers off and you'll be home when your children get home from school. That didn't strike me as a good reason for choosing a career. Um, and so I really wanted to address this, this shift and this shift that we're also seeing in younger people where they don't stick to one organization. They're looking for certain things. They're looking for education. Uh, they're looking for personal growth. And they, they move a lot. And it's been disturbing to me to hear from my coaching clients that they don't have a plan. So really there, there are three things and I can, will address them you know, as we go along that I think are necessary to have a rewarding 
work life? Well, I, I want to get to that place, but I want to make sure we get a, a snapshot of your book. I don't want to give away all the details because it's, it's very rich. But you start this book in a way that most experts don't. You really took a risk. Can you talk about your approach to this book and how it's different? I felt that if I was going to be giving people advice about their lives, that I ought to be very transparent about my own life. Um, I think that we learn from our own mistakes, but I also think that we learn from other people's mistakes and other people's changes. And <clears throat> excuse me, some of the things that I ask people to do in the book, I didn't feel comfortable asking them to do unless they ga I gave them my life as an example. So this is different because each chapter has a section of my life story and explains why this might be important to three different groups of readers. You even go back as far as your grandparents and their history. Without giving away too much, how does, that, how does talking about that or knowing about that help one's career choices? Phyllis, almost every woman that I interviewed for uh, my earlier book, 50 Over 50, uh, that you're in, you might recall, talked about their childhood. And, and some of them, um, especially a, a, a dear friend of ours, um, Carol, talked about the influence that her grandparents had on her. And I could see that we need to know these things in order to make sense of our own life patterns, you know, and, and, and was there a dichotomy? For me, there was a huge dichotomy because the Italian side of the family, uh, the women stayed home, the, um, all of the children went out and worked um, to put my grandfather through college. They drew his name out of a hat, but the girls' names weren't in that hat. So things like that, you know, this side didn't work. The other I, side- I just wanna replay that so that the audience really gets it. So you tell this, you tell some amazing stories in this book, but in this scenario, mm -hmm. this large family had a number of children. Yes. They couldn't afford to send them all to college. So they decided to draw a name out of a hat. Now you do mention that the girls didn't get in the hat at all, which is another right. discussion. But just that they just pulled a name out of a hat and, and all everybody else had to work towards getting that person through college. But that was your father. That was my grandfather. Your grandfather. My maternal grandfather. And he was very successful and yet, to the day they died, his brothers resented him because oh. what would their life have been if their name had been drawn from the hat? Oh, so just, I mean, again, looking at your story, even though I've known you for years, I did not know this. And it does, it does you can see the threads in the book that you draw to your own conclusion. So I invite people to, to read this because it'll get you thinking about, hmm, how did I make this decision? It doesn't always just spring from your heart like a well or a fountain. It may have threads all the way back uh, to your past. They do. And jumping a little bit forward, um, I am math phobic. Ah. Totally math phobic. And I know exactly what caused that because my Aunt Claire, with whom I was living for a period of time, taught multiplication by the wooden spoon method. Now, you may not know the wooden spoon method, and I'm, I'm going to use a pen to illustrate this. She would ask, 
what's two times two? This is the wooden spoon. And if I responded four, I did not get hit in the head with the wooden spoon. So now if you ask me to multiply, I am more likely to duck than to multiply. So what did that mean for my career choices? What did that mean for things that I had to um, accommodate in my work life by finding someone else who could do it? Because I believe you use your strengths and build them and you hire somebody to take care of your weaknesses. So as you say, this is the, I don't want you to tell all the stories because that's a juicy one, but that's, that may really help a lot of people. The, the wooden spoon method of learning math, which did not work. Um, so in the book, you talk about, you have exercises that you've designed, um, but I want to ask you a very specific question. So in our society, you go to a cocktail party and someone says to you, well, what do you do? That question is based on the old model of career. Yes. How can a serial careerist answer that question? Um, that's a good question. And I think probably everyone will have to generate their own version of the answer. Um, mine has been, I've been lucky with this for the past um, couple of decades. Well, I'm a coach and a consultant and that covers a lot of things. For someone else, it might be, oh, I'm an artist. And then they ask a question very quickly in return to move away from having to be more specific or I'm a generalist. So I think you have to have your own tag for this. And, and just go with that and understand that however you've chosen to lead your life is an important path. That's the, that's the fantastic answer. And you write, you use a term in the book that I, I'm gonna keep forever. Will you talk about cluster skills yes. um, and how they might relate to each other in different ways. Can you tell a story about that? Um, sure. And I have to say that one of the things that's important to someone reading this book is that the first thing you have to do is to know yourself thoroughly. And that's why I suggest writing your own life story. And the second thing you have to know is what are the skills that you have and how do they fit together? And which ones are the ones that you're willing to use even though they're not the thing you're best at. So um, I, had a, I had a student who um, discovered, she was gonna be a teacher's aide and she discovered that she was good at working with people, at convincing people, at speaking and at organizing. And there may have been one more. And when she started researching, she found that there were two career options for her. And one was circus clown and the other was politician. <laughs> but I, I will make no comment on that. Uh, however, uh, she had gone from someone whose husband called her mummy, as in the rap kind of mummy, not as in British mother. Um, and she knew she had to get out of those wrappings. So she ran for the community board based on the fact that she knew she had the skills from putting together clusters of skills that she was good at. She won the election and she went on eventually to the New York State Assembly. Hmm. Yeah, I think that um, we have been putting people in boxes for too long. Your book breaks apart that whole notion. There may be some skills that uh, really support something else completely. I think you talk in the book about someone who had skills in dealing with uh, drug addicted people and working in that, and that in fact, they were able to use their skills in dealing with young people and their career choices. Uh, well, it was actually a little more specific than that, if you don't mind. Uh, she had spent 
about 20 years working with ex-addicts. And she discovered that those were exactly the same skills that overachievers use. So she switched over to a much more lucrative career in coaching young executives. Hmm. So there are parallels in places that we might not suspect. Yes. And that's very hopeful um, because as you write, the world is reorganizing, the world is shifting. And even the careers that we thought of as careers aren't the careers anymore. Yes. Uh, that's, that's the thing that is uh, jarring to many people. I noticed I have a young daughter. People are always saying, well, what are you going to do? But the answer to that question is change, has changed even within a two year period, not for her, but into the world in which she's stepping due to the pandemic. Yes. So. And yet even for her, because given her talent, she can use that in so many different ways. And there's, there's one thing that I want to be sure to mention, if you don't mind. Please. And that is that the third essential in, in the book is have a plan. And lots of people, I don't need a plan, and, you know. Um, and it's never true. I didn't have a particularly good plan. I never thought about it. I got lucky a lot of times. And I've found over the years working with clients that if they construct a plan based on what they know about themselves personally and based on their skills, that they can always chuck that plan, but it's there to come back to. They know that they've got an over, it's like scaffolding, you know? You, you may decide the house is gonna look very different midstream, but still there's an overall organization to things, so. Well, that's very powerful. And you sort of need the plan as a benchmark, even if you're gonna change it. I've learned this from you. Uh, you are a master at uh, the, what you called life architecture and building blueprints for people. Uh, so that shows up in this book as well. But this is even gentler though. When you talk about a plan now, I think there's more, I think the plan is based on being prepared for the change, the changes that have occurred. What about, what about older people? Um, in terms of can, can someone who's older really benefit from what you have written? Yes, I am starting to work with some women who are in their mid seventies and are trying to figure out what they're gonna do when they grow up. And, you know, and they, they, they need a plan they don't realize the skills that they've developed over the years. Um, a former dancer and opera singer who spent many years in talent management hasn't quite figured out how to transition that into writing, which is what she sees as her next career, for example. Um, somebody like Cheryl Benton, who you've interviewed, um, was supposed to be a high school teacher, as was I, and stumbled into marketing and built several companies of her own. And as she, as she aged, she started noticing that women in a certain age group had no access to really good information about how to entertain themselves. So it started out as a newsletter is now an empire, including a publishing company and annual live events. Yeah, so you're, you're never too old. I know a couple of 86 year old singers who are still performing on a regular basis. So there's a little bit of a need for an entrepreneurial spirit. And I just want to say for clarity, Cheryl Benton is nowhere in her 70s. 
So not yet. <laughs> so, um, but to, just to, to say that it seems that you're talking about the need for uh, an entrepreneurial spirit. Yes, and I think that this is true whether you choose an organizational path or not, because as you know, there's a thing called intrapreneurship. And to succeed in the corporate world now, you have to have an entrepreneurial spirit and, and know what to push forward and how to organize it and think of the company's product or the part you're working on as your product. And this is another thing that I see in my executive coaching clients, that to the extent that they can do that, they rise up in the company. So again, we know each other so well, so let's just pretend we don't know each other well. I'm gonna ask you a question. Um, I've run across a lot of naysayers in my life. You know, the, a lot of people who think uh, you're aiming too big or that is, you know, people like you don't get to do that or you're too old and you better uh, start thinking about what's possible in your life. How do you personally handle the naysayers? I mean, besides just not talking to them if they're in your life, how do you handle it? That's a tricky question because if the naysayer is me, then I need to get somebody else to remind me of, of who I am. If the naysayer is a client that I'm working with, you know, because all of us go through that, I think. If it's somebody I'm working with, then we go back and we look at the high points of their life, of the things that they've done well, of their successes. And I challenge them basically to engage their inner Wonder Woman because she's there, you know, and just step up and, and try it. What's the worst that could happen? It could not work out and then you'll try something else. But uh, um, a professor that I had in graduate school had written, has now written maybe 20 books and hundreds of articles and done back in the days when we used to have eight track tapes, coaching tapes and is, is world famous. And he's going up to present at a conference that I'm facilitating and he grabs me by the arm and says, Susan, I can't go up there. They don't wanna hear from me. I don't know anything. And in my best coachly fashion, I just punched him in the arm and said, well, no name. That's a bunch of, you know what, and pushed him up on the stage. But to hear that someone who is well-established still has these same feelings of doubts just reminds me that we're all human. And this is why I have, in fact, one of the exercises is to find your, um, your, your um, support circle. And some keep, people call it your board of directors. Call one of them, dial a friend as they say on the TV show and, and get reminded of who you are and what you know and pick yourself up and just say, I say to myself, get over it, you idiot, and get back to work. Well, that's, that's, I just, I think we went really fast in that module. I just want to parse it out a little bit. Sure. So first of all, when you say the board of directors, you don't want someone calling their actual board of directors. You want them to create their own board of directors Yes. close people who love them and who can pull them out of the hole that they get fall in, that they fall into. Um, how do you, you know, you must have, maybe you haven't had this experience. I've had the experience where I've had friends who would fit in that circle, but also friends, or I think they're friends, who were just a little bit jealous, who want to keep you in that hole. 
Yes. Um, how do you distinguish that? I mean, can you, you know, because the people you love, but they're still good at giving you a zinger to keep you in your place, kind of. You know, it depends on which category of the four that you have them in. So if they're your comforters, then that can only be people who will do nothing but listen and say, uh-huh, 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 and I'm so sorry, and bring you chocolate or wine or whatever you want, wrap you up in a comfortable uh, comforter, you know, while you're having this conversation and stay until you're ready to relax, go to sleep, whatever it is. Those people never say a bad thing about anyone. And the funny thing is, if someone is complaining about their husband or boyfriend or wife or girlfriend, whatever, um, and they're saying, oh, so-and-so is it, blah, 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 blah. the comforter says, oh yes, I know, I'm so sorry. And then when they get to the point in the cycle where they're saying about that same person, well, you know, here she is really wonderful and does this and this, the comforter says, you know, I always thought that. So all they're doing is mirroring the emotion in the moment and offering support. Now, then you've got your, um, your critics who could be sometimes a little snarky and this is where it's hard because sometimes your critics will tell you things that don't ring true. So you're listening to your heart and dropping them off your list immediately if that's the case because your critics are the one who show you where the holes are in what it is you're developing and help you get, help you really close them up. They are not the ones that say, oh, Phyllis, you can't do that. That's never going to work. You know, and especially if you know they're doing similar things. I've dropped pe people who have done that to me. Um, then you've got your cheerleaders. And again, your cheerleaders are another nothing but positive. If you put your shoes on the right feet, they're going to say, oh, brilliant job you did how wonderful <laughs> you know uh, and you can always count on them to make you feel better when you need it you know and then you've got the confronters and the confronters I really like and I have to say that I have a writing group that does that for me and the first question on every call is well Susan what have you written this week hmm well, let's go back to the heart for a minute, because yes. your book definitely is something that nourishes the heart, so that if you're feeling like the career that you're in, you're stuck, or that you need to make a change, or that you feel guilty about what you've done in terms of your career, this is the book to help you shine a light on possibility yes. uh, and open you up. You have your, your subtitle is Seven Strategies for a Unique Career. And we're all unique. So we, what you're saying is we get to define our careers. No one else but you can define your career. And no one but you knows what possibilities are going to turn into. And... Um, a woman who I don't mention in this book, but I've written about before, was at the top of the organization in a bank. And her husband decided they needed to have alpacas. Well, he lost interest in the alpacas practically immediately. So she ended up running an alpaca farm and built a whole career around not only breeding and selling alpacas, but having people make garments out of the alpacas. So, you know, you don't know- Out of, out of the fur from the alpaca, alpacas, yes, not the alpacas. Not the alpacas. I don't want to get Peter <laughs> writing to me on this book. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> of the fur that has to be trimmed annually for the good of the animal. Okay. <laughs> She's making clothing. 
So you you know you you don't know what surprises are out there, and um, there's a really old um, well, there's a, a Wayne Dyer book that the title is I think um, when you believe it you'll see it, and that's half of the story. But the other half of the story is if you look for the unusual, there's there's an exercise where you're told to go out and look for a red car. And once you see the first red car, you see nothing but red cars. So go out, and it's one of the things that I recommend, go out and take a workcation. Go out, and, where, which is where you can go and try a job for two weeks, three weeks, and see what you think of it. Go out and visit things that are unusual and appeal to you and take a moment to stop and just envision yourself in that environment. And you'll know pretty quickly whether it's for you or, or not for you. You know how you can walk into an organization and say, oh, please, I can't get out of here fast enough. Yep. Thank you for the gift of your book. Susan Meyer is a coach. Dr. Susan R. Meyer is a coach, consultant, and an expert on the challenges that face women in their careers. I really appreciate your time. Is there anything you'd like to add as we close our conversation? Um, of course, it's always marvelous to have the opportunity to speak with you in this way. Um, and I recommend it to everyone. Um, but back to, to the book, I really think that this is a useful book at this time. There will be a coaching program to follow that will allow people to get support as they go through this work. Um, and everything is possible right up until they close whatever receptacle you're going into and put it in the ground or stash it on a shelf. Everything is possible. Just keep believing that. Thank you, Susan. Funda TV and its team are proud and excited to be part of the CNJN family.